Well, thank you, ladies, for that beautiful music. And for the Castro family, too, earlier on. Beautiful. We've been really blessed today. Our speaker today is uh, Pastor Royce Odiar. And at this time, I'd like to welcome his wife, Michelle, and their 16-month-old boy, Josiah. Royce is the son of Hector and Beth Odiar, who many of you know. And Hector and Beth attend the Kelowna Church. Royce is an Okanagan man. He came here when he was two. And he attended OKAA, which is now OCS. And he is now finishing up not one, but two master's degrees at Andrews University in the United States. And we thank you for coming, Royce, and we welcome you to the pulpit of the Rutland Church. And we look forward to hearing the message that you have for us today. And may God guide you as he leads you, as you lead through his word. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, John. And reflecting on the special music this morning, and the second special music this morning, it was powerful to think, one day, by the grace of God, soon, we will be the church at rest. Amen? And so the church has one foundation, Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't think there could be a more fitting uh, song to go along with my message this morning than that. And it's amazing to see how God leads and how he orchestrates and puts things together. And the reason I say that is because as we speak about church, we're talking about the special community that God has placed on earth for us to be able to reflect his love and to share his love with the world. And so that foundation of that church is Jesus Christ, and we want to lift Jesus Christ up always. And so a special thanks to Emily and Jillian for their special music. A special thanks to the Castro family. There's nothing more wonderful than seeing uh, families and young people involved in worshiping and praising and serving God. That is such a blessing. And we have to treasure that and we have to nurture that in every way we can uh, because uh, the young people are, uh, are our future. They are our present and we have to involve them in every way we can. Again, thank you, John, for the warm welcome. It's nice to be back in the area uh, to see many uh, friendly faces from far and from close. Um, but it's nice to be here this time of year. And as we reflect on God's leading in our past year and as we enter another year, it is a wonderful privilege to be able to be here to study God's word with you. And so I'm going to pray one more time. Uh, and I'm going to ask that God will speak especially to us. We've been blessed in so many ways, but right now as we study his word, we need to hear a special word from him. And so please bow your heads with me as I pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And so we ask that your word would speak to us today. We have been promised in scripture that the word is living, that it is powerful, that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. So we ask that as we reflect on your word, as we study your word, as we hear your word, that it would enter into our hearts, that it would, that it would discern the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. We pray that as, as we hear you speak into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds, that you'd give us the strength to respond to what we are hearing. And if your voice has grown faint in any of our lives, in any of our minds, we pray that you'd revive our conscience, revive our ears to hear what the word has for us today. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us of sin, of anything that stands between us and you, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you would pour out your Spirit in a mighty way, that we would be filled with your Holy Spirit. We need this gift more than ever before. And I ask that you would hide this preacher in the shadow of the Almighty, and that you would be glorified and honored today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me again in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 23 to 25. We, will, we won't reread the entire section, but it's important to reflect on it because it sets the, the tone for the message this morning. It talks about the importance of community, the importance of assembling ourselves together. This is the central idea for our study this morning, and so I just want to specifically emphasize verse 25. We heard the first two verses, which are beautiful, which are powerful, which set the context. But we need to look specifically, actually, at verse 24. It says, let us not consider, let us, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I remember growing up and focusing on verse 25, and, and it's been a favorite verse of mine for, for a long time, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's so important to come together in community, amen? That is a critical function of the church, to come together, to encourage one another, to exhort one another. But verse 24 gives us another clear aspect of, of why we come together. We come together to stir up love and good works. I believe that more than ever before, especially as we conclude one year, we get closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so more than ever before, we must stir up love and good works. And when we think of good works, we often think of obedience. But I think another way to look at it that it's important is that it is love in action. That's what good works is. It's really both. It's obedience and it's love and action. And a challenge sometimes as we study the Word of God and as we read Scripture and as we try to follow God faithfully is we get stuck with one focus and we often miss the full picture of what God wants us to do and how He wants us to live. God calls us to live out both justice and mercy, both obedience and love and action. And when we come together, we need to be stirring this up, stirring up this love, stirring up this, these good works. As we reflect on community, the title of the message this morning is, You Are Not Alone. If there's one thing I want to make sure that none of us leave without understanding and knowing, it is that God wants you to know that you are not alone. We have just went through a complete year of 2019, and I'm sure there have been struggles and there have been trials, and for some of us there, have been, there has been one trial after another. And perhaps some of us are in a stage in life where we feel very lonely. But part of the message this morning, the central idea is that you are not alone. Each of us need to take this to heart. Young and old, visitors, regular attenders, people who have been here who helped get this church going, we all need to remember no matter where we are and what stage in life that we are not alone. And that's the impor importance of community. Community comes together so we can surround one another. People, we're surrounded by people who care, people who can help, people who can lift us up when we are down. And as I reflected a little bit on the vision statement of the Rutland Church, it seems that this is exactly what Rutland Church is striving to do, striving to be, to be the family of God by loving Him and loving others. This is what Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 is talking about. This is the experience that, that you as a church have chosen as, as your vision, the way you want to live, the way you want to be known in the community is to love God, to be the family of God, loving Him and loving others. So the question I have for us this morning is, will your church, will this church, will our churches be a harbor of hope. I'm sure during the holidays there's many visitors here, and so this message is equally important to, to each of us, no matter where we come from, to go back with this thought, with this idea. Will our churches be communities of grace? Will our churches be a safe growth environment where any, 
where we can nurture anyone in need. So I have an important question that I want you to wrestle with now, wrestle with throughout the sermon. At what cost? How committed and sacrificial will we be to achieve or to to shape this kind of church and to be these kind of people? I mean, let's be honest. We're not here just to say nice things. We're here to realize that, that often when we have a vision for how we want the church to be, whatever church we come from, whatever church we represent, we often fall short of what that vision is for the church and what that vision is that God has for us. And that's okay. We're humans. We're sinners. But God wants to build us up. God wants us to achieve this. So the question is, at what cost? How committed and sacrificial will we be to have this kind of church and to be these kind of people? This is an important question, something we need to ponder, something we can't solve and fully reflect on in just a few moments here together. But I challenge us to think about this clearly and and carefully. One word that I believe, in addition to the word community, that is important for this message today is the word resilience. I believe that in order for us to be resilient, we must find strength, comfort, courage, and courage in the truth that we are not alone. So that's the premise. That's the idea of my message this morning. Community is so important. We come together in community to stir up love and good works. But why? We do it for the sake of resilience. We do it for the sake to to strengthen one another, to get up again when we are struggling and when we have fallen. Amen? We can't do it alone. We need one another. Loving community is an essential ingredient for resilience. And when we talk about resilience, perhaps lots of different ideas and thoughts and stories and experiences come to your mind. And there are, it's true, there are many aspects and many different components that allow a person to be resilient. The aspect we're going to focus on this morning is community. We only have time to look at that one aspect. But I believe that that is the most important aspect of resilience. So the question is, what is resilience? I think we all have an idea, but it's the ability to bounce back. It's, it's continuing to try and to not give up no matter how long it takes. Here's a great example that I think many of you will appreciate and be able to resonate with. Um, and I just use my own example here. My wife, Michelle, and I, we are blessed to have a healthy baby boy. He's active. He's full of energy. And ever since he started walking... He falls a lot. I'm sure we can identify with that, watching kids grow. And so as a toddler, he, he's learning to walk. He's learning to cr- climb. He's getting faster and faster. But the faster he goes, the harder he falls. But he doesn't give up. He is resilient. He gets up over and over again. Some would argue that this is a picture of individual resilience, but it isn't. Instead, Michelle and I are there. We encourage him time and time again. And we kiss him and we hug him when he has fallen hard and he's, he's crying. And we, we give him that support that he needs. So yes, he has to make the choice to get up and to try again. But he has that community. He has that support. The world would have us believe that resilience is something from within. And yes, there's a place for self-discipline and determination. But I believe without that outside community, without that support, and in the context of the Word of God, and in the context of spirituality and church, without the family of God, without the church community, we cannot be truly resilient. We will now consider a powerful biblical story of resilience that's found in the book of Ruth. And while we do this, I would like each of you to reflect on your own stories of resilience. 
I provided in the bulletin a, a little reflection card that looks like this. Uh, I trust that everyone has one. If you don't have one and would like one, please raise your hand. I believe the deacons are, are prepared to, to hand it out to anybody who does not have one, but I encourage you to get it out and to take some notes. So please raise your hand if you need one and would like one. There's one in front here. I don't know if we have someone that's going to do that. Yeah, they will. They will come. So we'll see. When they come, I'll let them know there's one hand in front. But just kind of keep your hand up if you, if you uh, need one. And so on the first part, this is where you can jot down some of your notes, some of your, your experiences with being resilient. And we also have some pencils. So if anyone needs a pencil... Um, <laughs> Keep your hand up as well. All right, so turn with me to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. It's just a short book, four chapters. And we're going to start with verse 1. Ruth chapter 1. It goes Joshua, Judges, then Ruth. So it's right at the beginning of the Bible, basically. We're going to read verses 1 to 5. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Hilion. They were Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Mahalon and Hilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Often as we read these stories, we will study them and we'll think about them intellectually and we'll look for a truth that we can apply to our lives. But today we want to try to go a little bit deeper. We want to try to get into the story to see it from Naomi's perspective, to see it from the, through the eyes and the experience of some of the other characters and people in this story. Perhaps some of us here can identify with Naomi. You've lost a husband. You've lost a child. In her case, she's lost a husband, both her sons. She's in a foreign land. If anybody had a reason to be discouraged, to be hopeless, Naomi would certainly qualify. Furthermore, she's in the Middle Eastern cultural context, and without a husband, without children or sons specifically, to help provide and to protect, she was essentially destitute. She had nothing and no one to provide for her. Perhaps we do not understand the severity of her, uh, severity of her situation but Naomi herself expresses her utter grief in chapter 1 in, in several of the verses that we'll quickly look at. Verse 13, the last part says, No, my daughter, she's talking to them. She has the responsibility now of taking care of two daughter-in-laws, but she says, I have nothing for you. It grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then verse 20, later Naomi is reflecting on, on her misfortune again. She says, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She was having her Job experience, I think it's safe to say. She says in verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? 
She was at the bottom, the lowest experience point of her life. What next? What does she do now in the foreign land that she is in? Verse 6 tells us that she hears, she gets word, a glimpse of hope that God has attended to. He has visited the people of Israel. And so she has no other option. Her only hope is to return to the land of Judah. And so she returns home, and at first she begins the journey with both of her daughter-in-laws. One eventually leaves, as many of us who know the story remember. But Ruth stays with her, and so Naomi and Ruth, they continue journeying back to Bethlehem, now with a grain of hope. But they would have to work for it. They would have to work hard. You see, God, in His abundant mercy, justice, and love, had designed a system of gleaning. Israelite law, law instructed that farmers not reap the edges of their field or go over it a second time. In other words, this provided the poor an opportunity and needy families with the opportunity to glean the leftovers. But of course, this would not be easy. This would, not be this would be very challenging. I'm not sure. I didn't take the time to reflect on what a modern equivalent to this would be. Maybe picking up pop cans on the side of the road or out of people's recycling bins. I'm sure there's various equivalents that we could apply today, but you have to realize that, that as the story goes, Ruth had to go into the fields day after day after day in the beating sun to pick up pieces of grain. Not big bundles, just the leftovers, just the stray pieces that she could find. It would be a humbling experience. Perhaps they had never done this before and were not ex ex uh, experienced with this kind of hardship. And so they journey, and this is the plan of survival that they have. With the plan in place, Ruth heads to the fields. We do not know if it was the first day or after many days of gleaning, but in chapter 2, verse 19, Naomi asks Ruth, where have you gleaned today? Maybe she had asked this question every day. Maybe the answer was the same day after day. Or maybe this time the answer was different because Ruth came home with more than she ever had before. By this point in the story, we have already been introduced to Boaz, who is a wealthy landowner. He is also a close relative. But the story indicates that neither Naomi or Ruth had planned to glean in Boaz's field. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, we don't know. It does not indicate that that was the case. But rather, a careful reading reveals that God had been orchestrating a divine appointment. Naomi recognizes God's providential working when she says in chapter, 20, uh, in chapter 2, verse 20, that God has not forsaken them. But this begs the question, why now? Why did it take this long for God to act? Why is it that God allowed a fam famine to take Elimelech and his family to Moab? Why did God allow Naomi to become a widow and childless? These are only some of the multitude of questions that arise in our minds when we face pain suffering, and death. And even when we study the Word of God and we see experiences like this and we wonder, why did God do it this way? Why did He allow it to happen? But what if we don't have all the answers? Do we always have to know why? Should we blame God? Or is someone else at fault? The story of Ruth is not designed to answer these questions, but to demonstrate that if we hang on, 
God always comes through. If we hang on, not only does God always come through, but according to Isaiah 61 verse 3, He will make beauty out of ashes. No matter how discouraged and hopeless Naomi has been to this point, she has not lost all hope. Chapter 2 verse 20 says, Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken His kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. It seems to me that it is at this point that she realizes and recognizes more fully that God has not forsaken her, that God has been prov providentially leading them to this point and providing someone who can help. Because you see, the barley harvest is only going to last for a short time. Even if they glean every single day, which the story says that they did up until the end of the harvest, what happens then? What happens when the harvest is over and the provisions are gone and there's nothing more to glean? There has to be a new plan, another plan. And so as we're reflecting on resilience, we want to pause right now to ask a few questions. How is it possible that these two women have been able to be resilient to this point? Did they do it alone? Could they have done it alone? What would have happened if Naomi did not have Ruth with her? What would have happened if God had not instituted the system of gleaning? And what if Ruth had not found favor in the eyes of Boaz? Would they have been resilient? The key to resilience is community. When we know that we are not alone, when we have someone, anyone, and even better, a community surrounding us in times of our greatest need, it is impossible. The impossible becomes possible. So how does the story end? The story reaches its climax with Ruth, Ruth appealing to Boaz in chapter 3, verse 9. She says there, Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. But will Boaz respond? And will he be able to help? Let's read verses, follow as I read verses 10 and 11. It says, And they said to her, Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Chapter 3, verse 10. Then he said, Boaz said, Blessed are you. Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. For you have shown more kindness to the end than at the beginning. In that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. These verses paint the most beautiful picture of Boaz offering his unreserved compassion and help to Ruth and Naomi. Here we see that Boaz is willing to be God's instrument for resilience. But the story does not end here. If we had time, we would see how it, how, it, how, it sh how it goes, how it shapes. But there's a critically important twist that happens because, because Boaz is not the first in line to be the person to help. Or in the biblical Old Testament understanding, Boaz was not able to be their redeemer. 
So he had to go and make the proper arrangements. Would he have this opportunity to help or would someone else step in? Let's read verse 1 of chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. The language there is interesting because it's not just he happened to come by. The text and the narrative, the way that it is shaped, seems to indicate that God was leading him to come by just at the time that Boaz was there. And so Boaz said, Come aside, friend. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. But in there is another very important detail. Some of your Bibles may have a footnote right beside the word friend or by the word sit down. And if you look at that footnote, it will say the Hebrew means literally so and so. So he didn't actually say friend to him. He did not call him by name. Or if he did, the writer of the book of Ruth puts it into uh, he, he, he leaves this person as nameless to establish a critically important, important point. He's trying to, the author is trying to contrast between this, this closest relative and Boaz. Boaz uh, the, other, the relative is first in line, but Boaz is before him in honor and in conduct and in his willingness to help those in need to be resilient. The Net Bible translates that section there as Boaz saying, come here and sit down, John Doe. This, this character is minimized in the bi biblical story. So what's his name? Well, it doesn't really matter because the story goes on to illustrate that this relative cares more about self than his own family. So after bringing the matter to what's his name, it seems that at first, Boaz is going to lose his opportunity to redeem Naomi and take Ruth as his wife. But then, when what's his name realizes that to get the land, he has to marry Ruth, he says, no, it will jeopardize my plans, my agenda, my inheritance. What's-his-name was only interested in property, not a person or people. Thus, what's-his-name says, no deal, I'm out. It's all yours, Boaz. And this part of the story illustrates a most important point. We've already talked about the contrast between what's-his-name and Boaz. And this emphasizes the opportunity that each of us have to be instruments of resilience. So as we reflect on these two characters as on what's his name and on Boaz, we have to ask ourselves, what would we do if we were in their shoes? What would we do if we were in their situation? What would we do when we see people in our lives who are struggling and are discouraged and need our help? What happens when they need our help more than once or twice or three times? What happens when they need our help so much that it seems to consume all of our life, all of our time, and puts our inheritance and our resources in jeopardy? What choice will we make when we're in that situation? Will we take the path of least resistance, like what's his name? Or will we follow the example of Boaz to be an instrument of resilience. There's another story about a God man who cared all about people and not possessions. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God prophesied that through the seed of this God man, humanity would be resilient. They could not do it alone, they would need a redeemer. We are told that this Redeemer would be bruised and beaten and killed. But even though his heel would be struck, he too would be resilient and would crush the head of the serpent. He did not do it alone. 
the characters in the book of Ruth were not resilient alone. And we cannot be more than conquerors on our own. We need the community of God. And so I come back to the question I started with. Is will we be this kind of community and at what cost? Will we answer the call no matter the cost? The benefit of being this kind of community is that we will have a church that flourishes. We will have young people who love God with all their hearts. We will be used as instruments to heal broken people. Families will have a place of refuge as they go through times of crisis and transition. The elderly will be cared for. Without a healthy, loving community, we have nothing. But with this kind of community, we can have everything. I appreciated the prayer by Brother Dan this morning, and he shared so many of the blessings and so many of the needs that this church and community have. And according to my understanding of the purpose of community, when we press together and when we nurture this loving community where nobody is left out, where nobody is alone, where everybody has a place to belong, we can have everything, and God will bless us abundantly more than we could ask or think. So I come back now to our reflection cards and your story of resilience. What have you experienced? Who was instrumental in your victory? Did you do it alone? Or was there someone, anyone, at some point in your life who was there to give you the extra support you needed to get through? Or sadly, are there experiences you had where you failed and never recovered because you did not have the community you needed? My, my appeal to you this morning is a simple appeal. I challenge you to think and reflect about your stories of resilience. And then to look for people in this community, in your neighborhood, who need to be encouraged with your story. Your story is a testimony. God did not help you through your experience for your own benefit but so that you could be a continual benefit to those around you. Maybe you can think of someone right away that needs to hear your story or you would like to share your story with this person. I encourage you to write their name down and to make a commitment that I will share my story with this person. If you can't think of a person, I encourage you to pray that God would show you someone who you can encourage. But maybe you don't have a story that you're ready to share. Maybe you feel like you are the person who needs that encouragement, needs to hear someone else's story. Oftentimes there are these, these unconscious barriers that keep us from, from helping one another in these times of need. And I encourage us, no matter what side of that barrier we are on, maybe we're afraid to reach out. We see someone struggling, but we're, we're like, well, I can't offer anything, or they might be embarrassed if I say something. I encourage you to break that barrier and to, to reach out, no matter how silly it seems or embarrassed you might feel. Or if you're the person suffering in silence and no one comes to you, I encourage you to reach out to somebody in this church community. I know there are many people here with powerful stories who would love to help and encourage it's time for us to stop suffering in silence. May this year be a year like no other. May, this, may we this year, by the grace and power of God, nurture communities of resilience where no one feels alone. May it never be said of us and the churches that we are a part of that when someone walks into our churches, that they do not find a friend and a place to belong. Now is the time, like never before, 
to press together as we await the soon return of Jesus. Please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word here together. And as we res reflect on the importance of assembling ourselves together, as we reflect on the importance of community and resilience, I want to pray a special prayer for those in greatest need right now. I want to pray a special prayer for the young people in our midst right now who are learning the challenges of life and will need the most encouragement now and I pray Lord that you would raise up mentors guides safe companions and friends to surround our youth and young people at a time when they need it most by the grace of God Lord may we be those people in Jesus name we pray Amen.